everybody here this morning. I told Brother Sam I was worried about him yesterday after when I was watching the Alabama game. We both had, we, it was sort of, uh, it was a cliffhanger right to the very end. <laughs> so it's good to see everyone here today. And we want to remember those that are traveling. I know Brother McAnally's having a good trip. And uh, Brother French, and Sister French are having good, I'm sure they're having a good time. Our lesson today is probably one of the most difficult that we have to deal with within the Lord's Church, and that's discipline from within. We have enough problems with uh, things in the world, in the world that we live in, but it's even worse when it's within the local congregation. And in, this, uh, in the Corinthian letter, we have no account that they had elders there at this time because he's addressing, he's talking to the members themselves. Discipline is to be in the local congregation where there are elders, that they have the leadership role in that. And, uh, but they did, apparently did not have those. Now, some of the congregations that Paul had established, he had went back and they had established, after they had been established for a while, he went and appointed elders. He also appointed Timothy and Titus, and he gave them the qualification of elders. And, uh, but here they have a problem that they have, to de that they have not dealt with. And it should have been dealt with at some time prior to this. But uh, Paul had had it reported to him, so he writes a letter. Now, they had written him a letter prior to this, uh, this writing concerning some problems they had and some answers that they wanted to questions. But this one didn't happen to be one of them, what we're going to be studying today. In 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, Verses 1 through 13 is where we're going to be studying today in our book. It says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such, and such sexual immorality as is not even among the Gentiles, that a man hath his father's wife. Now this is a problem that they had within the local congregation. Paul had had a report from the church from the house of Chloe concerning this. And they had not reacted to it. Now bear in mind that this is, it tells us here, that it's not even among the Gentiles. And that's saying a lot. Because the Gentile world in which they lived was very tolerant. They had no morals whatsoever when we study in history and uh, of, the, of the Roman world and the Gentile world of that day. Also, they, here in Corinth, it was a major port city, and it was filled with temples. And one of these temples was the Temple of Aphrodite, and they practiced uh, temple prostitution there as an act of worship. So this is the environment that these people had come out of. This was in the environment that the church at Corinth had to deal with every day. I know we think a lot of times that uh, the world that we live in is bad. And there's a lot of uh, bad things that happen in the world around us. It's on the news all the time. It's, uh, it seems like uh, we can't turn on the radio or television until something as bad has happened in the world in which we live. But they lived in a very sinful and, uh, world that they, of that day. And it was not, it wasn't frowned on. Even in the world in which we live, some practices are frowned on. But they didn't seem to have any type of restrictions whatsoever. But this was even a violation of uh, Roman custom that this situation would take place. And this is what they were faced with every day. Now the Jews had a, those that would be members of this congregation would have a certain knowledge of the law. And it had been condemned in Deuteronomy, the 22nd chapter and verse 30. So the Jews had a little bit uh, of uh, training concerning and teaching concerning what God's law was and how they should conduct themselves in a moral atmosphere. But this would hurt the church at Corinth, it would hurt the congregation within the community, and it would also hurt uh, the church itself. What's in the world is eventually going to get into the church. We're not immune because we have the name Church of Christ out on the, 
from the building. And when people are converted from this environment, it's hard to uh, stop old practices. That's the word, that is the nature of people. It's not easy. It's not easy to turn away from some of the things that people have done in the past. It's not easy when people have been members of the church for a long time to return, and they tend to return back to the practices that they once had. The environment we live in does affect the church. It's going to affect us in some way, form, or fashion. Florida has been ground zero for a religious era in my lifetime. And some of the doctrines that have uh, affected our brotherhood have come out of Florida. Had their beginning here in Florida, and they've had devastating effect on the church throughout the country. So we're aware of, and these have been doctrinal issues that elders and uh, congregations have to deal with. And he deals in, in, in writing to them, he deals with not only the individual, but their attitude. So it's a dual process here. He's, he condemns them as much as he does the individual. So you should have known better. The congregation should have had a different attitude about this. And verse 2 says, and you are puffed up. So they were puffed up because of this. They were not ashamed of the situation that has existed within their midst, within their congregation. And have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. So we live in today in a very tolerant society. I mean, it's just something that we have been ingrained in us. History shows us at a time past, uh, society was not as tolerant as we are. Uh, and, but today, we are a more tolerant society of things. And sometimes that has a, a tendency to have, its, uh, have inroads into the church. They should have been mourning at the scandal of this incest, but they weren't. They should have uh, realized the deep disgrace that this had brought about on the church. Today, many people, when they sin and they do things that they shouldn't do, usually they leave because they know people know what they should do. We know the difference between right or wrong. We know what conduct is acceptable and what conduct is not. And many times I know, I may have mentioned this before, I'm sure I have, that the saddest people that I know are those when you go and talk to them and they tell you, you know, I know that I'm living wrong, but I can't give it up. That's the saddest of all people. And it affects members, elders, deacons, preachers. It affects all of us that we have to be careful about this. And it's, it has no respect to age. It has no respect of how long a person has been in the church. That we have to be careful. I liken it to uh, the fire ants in my yard that we all seem to have. If you don't have them, you're very fortunate. When I kill them in one spot, they crop up somewhere else, and that's the way sin is. The old devil, he's always out there. He works 24-7, and he don't rest to try to tempt us. This person's soul was going to be lost. So whatever action is taken should not be taken because of malice, because of personalities. It should not be taken for personal reasons. It should be taken for concern for the souls of individuals. Sometimes people want to think if when these actions are taken, they think it's personal. I've heard people that talk about when we, we condemn actions in the world that are wrong. They say, well, you're prejudiced. You're prejudiced because of, of the way I live. You're wanting to judge me. Well, the Bible tells us that certain things are wrong and their souls are going to be lost. We need to be concerned not only about those from within the church, but those outside. And he condemns the Christians here at Corinth because of their attitude. It was not one of shame, but one of being they were puffed up about this. And he was still in fellowship. Many scholars and, and commentators believe that he had some type of position within the congregation. That he may have uh, been a very affluent person, that they may have been dependent on him financially. We don't know that. The Bible doesn't tell us. 
but they were afraid of losing him for whatever reason. God's design for the church, the blueprint for the church, does not depend on any one person. It doesn't depend on any one individual, not any one of us. It's dependent on all of us. And sometimes people think, it's, well, it's the preacher. Well, it's not. We are all servants, are the elders, are the deacons, are the Bible school teachers, but it's dependent on each and every individual. Now, we need those people so that the congregation can function. In verse 3 says, For I indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has done this deed. They seem to be glad that Paul wasn't there. Because if Paul had been there, it wouldn't have got this far. He would have already addressed it. But whether he is there or whether he is not, his actions would have been the same. Now, their actions may have been different had he been there to guide them. Considering the world in which they came from, and we read the Corinthian letter and both letters, we find that they are like many congregations today. And it through, there we through the writings that the Apostle Paul gave to them and to other congregations, we can see how we should conduct ourselves. But he had judged this person. In Matthew 6 and verse 19 says, And I, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven this authority was given to the apostles that doesn't mean that does not mean that they could go out and just do whatever they wanted to do by their own personal ideas and personal views paul in some of his writings would give his personal opinion but they were to bind things pertaining to what God and what Christ had instructed them to do. They had the ability and authority to know what was right and know what people should do. And this had been given to them through Christ, that they could do this. That doesn't mean that they could say something that was wrong, do something that was wrong. Who was it that did something wrong that had to be corrected? The very person he's talking to here in Matthew 16, the Apostle Peter. And Paul had to correct him. So even the apostles could make mistakes in life. But when they were to conduct themselves the way God had instructed them through the Holy Spirit, that they were there to teach people. They did not have the advantage of the Bible as we have it. They were dependent on the spoken word. They were dependent on the preachers and evangelists and those that would come in their midst. So here, they had the authority as apostles to do this, and Paul had this. Through the inspired word, we know how to deal with situations like this. And the choice is ours. And when this is done, it's not done because a person wants to do this, wants to punish someone, or, or get even with someone. It should be done for the sake of uh, the person's soul. If it's not done in the proper attitude, the ones exercising it are at fault, as much as the individual is. And verse 4 says, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this, they were to do this through Christ, through their attitude, acting for and in the seat of Christ. What would Christ have done? Christ had to, to correct the situation there in the temple, didn't he? Because he was displeased with the way they were conducting themselves. It was done on his authority. And when Paul is instructing them, he is instructing them concerning Christ and what Christ would have done. The Bible is our representative of Christ today. We don't have a private interpretation of things. We don't have, uh, it's not dependent on me or anybody else for what I think. We have to act in the way the Bible says. And Paul was a messenger of Christ to relay this and teach them. The apostles were to teach all things, instructing those people. Think about when we look at the Bible, we have the four Gospels, 
one book of history, one book of prophecy, and the rest teach us how to live after we become a Christian. So we have an awesome responsibility to learn. There's a lot to learn when we make that transition from living in the world to being a member of the church. Paul was not there in, his, in bodily there. He was somewhere else, but he was there in spirit. When the church acts according to the Bible, it acts in place of Christ. He says in verse 5, to deliver, to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord, Jesus. So he is to be delivered to that environment that he wants to be in. Not that the body would be destroyed. It hasn't been that long ago if an individual went afoul of the religious uh, organizations that were in control of much of the world that they could be put to death. If, you, if an individual was to speak against the religious organization that was in control, they could be put to death. Martin Luther lived in fear of his life the last years of his life after he broke with the Catholic Church. They actually put people to death. They could do that. They had the authority by civil law to do that. God didn't give them that authority. He was to be separate from the fellowship of the local congregation. I was watching the news one Sunday morning and they have a, a, a thing on the faith there, usually a little segment on it. And they had a person who was uh, an atheist. And it was a congregation of atheists. And I thought that was the craziest thing I'd ever heard of. But what they wanted was the fellowship like we have, a fellow atheist. They wanted that support. I thought, how crazy, what difference does it make? What, do you need? what are they going to teach him? He didn't go into that. He had formerly been a, a, a preacher of some sort. And he was an atheist, and he had a congregation of these people. So how sad it is that they want the fellowship of each other, of people that have a like uh, persuasion, but yet they don't want to have fellowship with God. Fellowship is important. And so he was to be excluded from the fellowship, from the association with the brethren in Christ. Yes. That's right. I mean, he. Uh, I didn't understand it. I and, and even the com even the people there. I don't know what their religious persuasion was. They didn't understand it. And it was a very short segment, so they didn't have. They didn't go into it very, de very in very deep detail. And this individual was to be regarded as a heathen. He was to have no more contact with the members of the church and the fellowship of that congregation. He was to be delivered by the authority of God into the power of Satan. Because if that's the way he wanted to live, that's where he needed to be. If one follows Satan, he can't have fellowship with Christ. We can't live in both worlds. We can't have it both ways. There was a fellowship of the family of God that he would no longer have access to. I don't know that we're as close as they were back then, today. We may, as a group, we may not be, have the fellowship and closeness that they had in the first century, considering the world in which they come. We should be close. We are the family of God. And what affects one of us affects all of us. And this individual will have to make a choice. Is he going to have fellowship with the world? Or is he going to have fellowship with the brethren and the salvation of his soul? The welfare of the offender himself is never to be lost sight of. If he remains in that situation, he will be lost forever. Verse 6, your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? 
Now we we don't un, we don't save a little piece of leaven. Y'all, you ladies that cook, and I wouldn't know anything about this. I tried to make some uh, rolls one time and used the wrong kind of milk. I used buttermilk, and they were as hard as a golf ball. And uh, but uh, the if you're going to make rolls, you go down to Publix and you buy one of those little packets of yeast and you put it in there and you mix it up and you'd go through the procedure. I wouldn't know how to do that either. I'd go down to Publix and buy it out of the bakery. And <laughs> but uh, because they do make very good pastries. But uh, this was what they did. And he's, he's, he's giving them an example that they will understand. And it doesn't take but just a little bit. And you can put it in there and they mix it up and let it set and it will rise. And they have bread. The glory and justification that they had was not good. It was not good to the individual and it was not good for the example that it set to the other members of the congregation and it was not good for the world in which they lived. And it would soon work the corruption of the whole body. It would it soon fill the whole congregation and have an effect. <clears throat> the same thing applies to sin within a congregation. It can affect more than just the individual. The, the biggest thing, and the biggest thing the devil wants to tell people, that what I do, that individuals want to say, well, what I do only affects me. And that's not true. It affects somebody. Our actions are going to affect somebody besides us. It may affect our spouse. It may affect our children. It may affect our fellow Christians. It's going to affect somebody or the people that we work with or the people that we come in contact every day. We do not live unto ourselves. There's going to be effect some way. We have seen the seeds of division in our lifetime. During the Restoration Movement, just as the different groups were beginning to come together in the 1830s, it wasn't long before the seeds of division would divide that movement into different branches. The old devil was there. As they began to come out of these different religions, and the, of the religious world that they lived in and go back to the New Testament. The seeds of division would cause them to go back to the very thing they're trying to come out of. And that's the way sin is. Sin is always there. We have seen in, this, in some of the movements that have taken place in the state of Florida that have uh, spread throughout the, the country. And it even has effect in some of the foreign mission fields. And the one way to ensure against error is for us to study our Bibles. Those of us who teach, those that preach, elders, deacons, whoever they are, if they know they have a congregation that studies and knows their Bibles, that congregation is going to stay on the right path. And we have been blessed here with elders and preachers and members that will stand for the truth. We have been very fortunate over the years to have men that would stand up for the truth and because we've had some very devastating things that have come out of this area and its effect on the Lord's church. Does anyone have any questions at this time? I talk a lot or any comments? I'll give you a chance to speak now because I don't know. I don't. I, I, Wednesday night I ran out of information, but I don't know that I'm going to run out of any today. I may have some left over. So, and verse seven says, "Therefore purge out, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us." Here is an allusion to the order that was given. In, Ex in Exodus 12 and verse 5, to remove all leaven from the Jewish house before Passover. Now he's doing the same thing that those of us who teach and preach do today. 
we go back to the Old Testament, we find a principle that we want to use and we apply it, those principles, to a lesson today. Because the Old Testament is our a schoolmaster to teach us. And so we have a great many lessons. So those that were uh, Jews of that congregation would understand. And he would be teaching the Gentiles of that congregation pertaining to what had been taught to the Jews in the Old Testament. And it was carried out in a very scrupulous manner in care by the Jews that they would go to great care to remove all of the leaven that was within that house before the Passover. They would take a candle and search in even the darkest areas of their homes to see that there was no uh, leaven that would remain in their house. And so the position of Christians today is like that of Israel of old. That we are to purge out that old. That we are to be new. And that new leaven is the, is the will of God. Not the will of the, of the world. That they may be pure, unleavened lump of holiness. And they must choose. They were to purge out their past sins and, and after they had obeyed the gospel. When the Passover lamb was sacrificed, they must have put, put away the leaven. And Christ is our Passover. He is a perpetual sacrifice for us. We must put from us the leaven of evil as the children of God. Paul uses an example here that both Jew and Gentile could understand. The Jews would understand it when he's talking about leaven in the Passover. And the Gentiles would understand it because they were aware of, of the making of bread. And then he could explain to them about the Passover and show that Christ was our Passover. And verse 8 says, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of, of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, he's not talking about a physical feast, the feast of the Passover here. He's not talking about something that we eat. He's talking about the lives that we live. And the, how that we are to be a new person. And he's dealing with telling them how they ought to act because of this. Trying to show them the influence when sin is within the congregation. Let us engage in the Christian life and put away all evil. Before he was talking about the person who had his father's wife. And now he's talking about the brethren within the congregation. Now he talks to Christians and what they should do and how they should conduct their lives. Our service to God would be acceptable only by putting away evil. And that's a very difficult thing to, to do. We should not have malice and wickedness in the Christian life. Discipline should be done with the proper attitude. If this is not done with the proper attitude, it will not be effective, and it will affect those who are exercising discipline as much as it does the one that is being disciplined. And verse 9 says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. This refers to an earlier letter that he has written to them. These people probably knew what they should do. They knew, they probably knew in that deep down that this was wrong. But they didn't have the motivation to do anything because, well, Paul's out of sight, out of mind. The Apostle Paul's not here, so we can get away with this. And they had ignored the letter that he had written to them. And he has to write again addressing this specific issue. The earlier letter was not pertaining, to, apparently not pertaining to this particular issue, but it was about what manner of life and who they were to associate with. And verse 10 said, Yet I certainly did not mean with sexually immoral people of this world or with covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need go out of the world. We live in a real world. We're not going to be able to separate ourselves in the world in which we live with people like this. 
It's going to be the people we work with, our associates, people that we meet, and even maybe some of our friends. And we have to say, no, I can't associate with you anymore. We have to be careful of the people that, uh, that we associate. I worked with a man that was an alcoholic. He was a very good electrician. And he told me one time that he didn't, he associated with people that drank. Well, did that help him? No. They'd say, they'd pop a one and hand it to him and say, here, drink this. And he'd do it. He didn't have the uh, strength to resist. He did not, he continued associating with the same people that got him into trouble. And we have to decide that sometimes. Sometimes we have to make those choices in life. And so we need to be careful who we associate with and some people we need to avoid. Verse 11, but now I have written you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral, covetous, or idolater, or reveler, or drunkard, or extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. And so he's getting to the, what he's trying to tell them, said these, you can't withdraw from the world. They, this is what led a lot of people to, uh, <clears throat> to go out into monasteries or into caves and say, I'm just not going to associate with anybody. I'm going to live all to myself up in some secluded and desolate place. Are they going to, they had created monasteries where people could get together and they, they would be nobody else there. And that's not what he's talking about. That they are to uh, withdraw from this world. We can't do that. If we withdraw from the world, how are we going to reach people? How, who did Christ associate with? Publicans and sinners, didn't he? He was criticized because of this. And these people obeyed. He found a willing audience. Those people that were criticizing him, they didn't, uh, they didn't believe him. They didn't obey him. In 1 Thessalonians 5, in verse 22 says, in the King James Version says, abstain from all appearance of evil. The New King James says, abstain from every form of evil. We are to abstain from things that are wrong. When in doubt, don't. If we think it might be bad, we shouldn't do it. And that covers a lot. In verse 12 says, For what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those that are inside? Paul's telling him, I don't have any authority over these people outside the church. <clears throat> Could you think of how ridiculous if you saw someone doing something and say, Well, I'm going to withdraw fellowship from you. I'm going to discipline you. They look at you like you're crazy. We don't have any authority over people in the world. We don't have, Paul is not giving them the authority to discipline the world. You can't do it. He had authority within the local congregation. The jurisdiction is within that congregation to keep that congregation pure and on the right path. That doesn't mean that we don't need to preach against the evils of the world. That doesn't mean that we're not to try to go out and to convert people. Because if we didn't go out and make contact with people in the world of this nature, then how would we convert them? We wouldn't. We wouldn't be here today if people hadn't gone out and tried to convert people of different uh, religious persuasions and those who are not don't have any persuasion at all. And so he's telling them that you exercise discipline within the local congregation and elders have the leadership within the local congregation when their elders there. And we don't need to add any additional burden. They've got enough to do as it is. And it would, have, it would be a waste of time. 
And there is a difference between discipline and condemning evil in the world. Discipline is something we're trying to change activity, change of the way a person lives and the way a person conducts themselves. And we cannot disfellowship someone that we don't have fellowship with and start with in the first place. Verse 13 says, But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore put away from yourselves the evil person. Those that are outside the world are not immune from the judgment of God. Just because they don't, they don't uh, believe in God, just because they may not have heard about God, just because they haven't obeyed the gospel, does not mean that they are going to get away scot-free, that they are better off not to even be taught, some people might say. In 2 Corinthians 5, verses 10 and 11 says, For, me, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, and whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. There are people who will say, well, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in God. So I am immune. No. Nobody on the face of this earth is immune from the terror of the Lord. Yes. Yeah. Fred, I, I think going back to what we originally started with, with the idea of intolerance and versus tolerance and so forth in the society that we live in, I think it's one of the biggest struggles that Christians face today is that if we don't spread God's word, then we are viewed as being intolerant. Yes. However, um, the Bible commands us that we have to not so much as be intolerant, but to spread the truth. And I think people don't like the truth because the truth hurts sometimes. Well, it, it tells them that the way you're living, you shouldn't do that. Right. But the scripture tells us that the truth shall make us free. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Hodge, chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. For more foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and striving about the wrong, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is a that is divisive after the first and second time, after the second admonition, reject. Knowing this, that if such is subverted and sinned, he condemned of himself. <clears throat> yeah. Titus 3, 9 Sometimes we people just they don't want to listen to it. They just they're they're not interested in it. And uh, that's why a lot of people say, well, I'm an atheist. If I'm an atheist, then that removes all restrictions. And I can do anything I want. I can conduct myself in any way I want. And yet there are many people who do not profess religion at all, and they'll sit down and write a check for uh, when a uh, disaster happens to help people. Where does that principle come from? It comes from the Bible. I mean, there, and there are many people who don't profess religion at all that work in these disaster areas. I've seen them on television. I don't, that uh, don't, they're not doing it because for religious and reasons. They're doing it for moral and ethical reasons. Some of it's rubbed off. During World War II, when uh, after the war and the Marshall Plan in Europe and they sent food to Japan, where does that principle come from? It comes from the Bible. I mean, normally, a defeated power, you're defeated. The, the winning power want to extract retribution. But we did just the opposite. And that's because the Bible tells us. I've, I've gotten away from my lesson right there. but <laughs> And the last and only choice they had was to put that person away. Paul had told them what to do. And now it's up to the local congregation to, to do what they have been instructed. 
They needed to follow his instructions. And the right thing to do is not necessarily always easy. Sometimes the right thing is the most difficult thing to do. It's, uh, it's easy to go along with the crowd. It's, it, it takes courage to say, no, I'm not going to do that. And what we see is, through their actions, that in 2 Corinthians 6 and through 11, that this person was restored. It had the desired effect. And then he goes in, in, in 2 Corinthian letter, chapter 2, he tells them how they should act. That the punishment that they had, that they had exercised, was no longer in effect when that person was restored. There's our bell. Do you have any questions? I have some more comments on 2 Corinthians 2, 6 through 11, but we'll save those for a later day. Yes, Sam? It was. Yes. 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 The day will return. Uh, in uh, Second Corinthians, second chapter, there, it, when he deals with them, he's telling them that you restore him. Once he's restored, you treat him as a brother. Let him know you're concerned about him, and let him know you're thankful. The angels in heaven rejoice when one returns. And we should not be like the elder brother in the story of the prodigal son. We ought to be thankful when someone is restored. If God forgives, God forgets, we should forget. But that's a hard thing to do, isn't it? Thank you. Any more comments? Thank you.